Woo! Yes! Thank you all for coming. My name is Felicia Smith. I am the racial justice and social equity librarian here. And woo! Actually, I'm the only racial justice and social equity librarian anywhere. <laughs> but I really appreciate everybody who tuned in and who showed up and showed out for our first ever um, Black Panther, Women of the Black Panther um, book event. This is very exciting, and these women are very special and should be honored. And so I'm so grateful that this book allows them um, to get their flowers while they're here. I'm going to introduce you to our moderator for tonight. I do, again, want to thank you for coming to Stanford Libraries. And our moderator tonight is Kim McNair. And come on up. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Professor Kimberly Thomas McNair. And I'm a lecturer here in the African and African American Studies program here at Stanford. Thank you all so much for coming. I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing our panelists for this afternoon. Uh, first up, our speakers will be one Erica Huggins. Erica is an activist, former political prisoner, and leader in the Black Panther Party. She has devoted her life to the equitable treatment of all human beings beyond the boundaries of race, age, culture, class, gender, sexual orientation, ability, and status associated with citizenship. For the past 40 years, she has lectured across the country and internationally. She spent 14 years in the Black Panther Party for self-defense and eight years as director of the renowned Oakland Community School from 1973 to 1981. Everybody, please welcome Erica Huggins. All right, she's on the way, okay. Our next panelist and speaker will be Stephen Shames. Uh, Stephen, please, please, for Steve, how you doing? <laughs> Stephen Shames has authored 15 monographs and his images are in the permanent collections of 40 museums and foundations. His work is dedicated to promoting social change and sharing the stories of those who are frequently overlooked by society. His two previous Panther books are Power to the People, The World of the Black Panther Party, and Bobby Seals, The Black Panthers from 2006 and 2016. So please give Stephen a hand. Our next speaker is M. Gail Asali Dixon, known as Asali. Asali is an ordained minister and serves as pastor of the South Berkeley Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Berkeley, California, and she has from 1998 to 2006. Prior to serving as pastor of SBCC, Gail Asali was a graphic artist for the Black Panther Party newspaper and drew for its back pages under the name Asali. So please give her a hand. In the early 1970s, at the age of 20, Rosita Holland Thomas joined the Seattle chapter of the Black Panther Party to work with the organization's community survival programs. She played a central role administratively and organizationally in establishing the free medical clinic while also working side by side with fellow party and community members to implement the free breakfast program for school children. So please give Rosita Holland Thomas a hand. And if I could have all of our uh, panelists join me here on the stage. We are first going to hear from Stephen, who has a uh, PowerPoint slideshow. 
correct. Okay. Evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I was a student at, at uh, Berkeley. Some of you may uh, know of Berkeley. That's at that school, the football team. The football team always kills Stanford every year. Ooh. <laughs> okay, I, that was a joke, because actually the opposite is true, isn't it? Um, we, we, Berkeley's never no, been known for football. Anyway, I was a student at Berkeley, and I um, met the, the Panthers. Uh, the Panthers were often at the ca on the campus, and I, I was uh, uh, 20 years old, and I was a uh, young photographer, and I was working for the Berkeley Barb and some of the other underground papers and documenting all the, the s things that were going on. In fact, in 1969, at Berkeley and San Francisco State were the first two third world, that we, at Berkeley we called it TWLF, Third World Liberation Front, strikes to create a black studies department. And at Berkeley and San Francisco State were actually the first two black studies departments in the United States. And the Panthers were active in both of those um, struggles. At any rate, Bobby Seale became like my big brother and mentor and brought me into the um, Panthers and changed my life because I really um, came firsthand, you know, as a, as, as a student to really see the most progressive revolutionary organization um, in the United States of which two-thirds of the members were women, and women were the, black, the backbone of the party. Women ran, for instance, the medical clinics. And what's interesting about the Panthers is they didn't make people come to them. They went to the people. And you see here in this picture that uh, two women and a man are doing sickle cell testing which the Panthers were doing when the government was basically ignoring testing for, for sickle cell. And here again is a, a sickle cell at one of the Panthers' conferences. The Panthers would have conferences like this, and they would give away bags of food, and not government food. Those of you who are familiar with what we used to call government cheese and government food, there was a nutritious food in the bag. And every bag had a a chicken, um, loaves of bread, milk, everything that was, was healthy. Um, again, medical. And you see in the picture on the right that the Panthers were in somebody's home. The picture on the right, the left is sickle cell testing. On the right is the breakfast program for school children. Again, in 1967, 1968, the government of the United States was not feeding children breakfast and lunch in schools. They did it because they were embarrassed because the Panthers started doing that. And I think they were, Erica can correct me, but I think they were feeding 10,000 children a day, or was it more? Maybe more. Okay. At any rate, the Panthers were the ones who did that again, serving the people, body and soul, and the women were the backbone of this. The women were the ones who were making it happen. One of the reasons I'm so proud to be involved in this, in this book is that, and I know the women in the audience know, and most of the men know this also, women have been active throughout human history, but they often do not get credit for anything. If you read, you know, when I was studying history in school, it was all about what great men did. We, you know, the, I didn't even know when I was like a kid going to school that women did anything except stayed at home and cooked. You know what I'm saying? It, <laughs> it's like it was absent. And I, I'm really proud to be part of this book because it really uh, hopefully gives a voice to these wonderful women who you're going to hear from shortly. Again, the breakfast program. Look at the picture on the right. The government wanted to portray the Black Panthers as an anti-white organization. But look who they're feeding. You know, again, 
Um, I, I hope these books will, will create a truer picture of our history. Nowadays, history is under attack, and we're not going to talk about that, but you all know what I'm talking about. There's certain people who feel that we can't teach an honest history of this country. Well, you can see, I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the bags of food, and you can see how full they are, what they are, and how many bags they, they were giving away. On the right is the one of the original Panther schools, which morphed into the school that Erica was the principal of. Uh, originally, the Panthers set up a school in a separate house for, for their children because the police were coming in. Here's another picture from the school. Again, teacher's a woman. You know, you, those of you who know the history of the Panthers know that the police were assassinating um, Panthers uh, in the middle of the night, and the Panthers put their kids in a separate house f hoping that the government wouldn't murder a bunch of children, which they didn't. And they set up a separate school for the children, and eventually that morphed into a school for the community, which was a school that won many awards, was very innovative. It wasn't just about book learning, but it was also about getting children involved in the community and understanding their community, which is one of the 10 points of the Panthers, to know the true history, education that teaches us the true history and that's one of the things that the Panthers did. What, what really impressed me about the Black Panther Party was it wasn't just about words. It, and it wasn't just about protest marches. It was about putting into practice in the community what a just society should be. And I, th I really believe that the Panthers and the women of the Black Panther Party created a blueprint for a just society, a blueprint which unfortunately in the United States we haven't achieved yet and we seem to be possibly going backwards, but maybe we can stop that together. Free clothing. Very important, registering people to vote. The Panthers, again, registered 10, 20,000 people to vote. They had registered enough people to have their own line on the ballot. But since the Panthers believed in coalitions, they made a coalition with the Peace and Freedom Party, which was a multiracial party, but mostly like white students and, and, and professors, professionals. And they actually ran candidates for office as early as 1968. Um, Bobby Seale ran for mayor, and uh, Elaine Brown ran for city council in Oakland in 1972-73. Bobby Seale got, came in second. He got 40% of the vote. In the next election, a black man, Lionel Wilson, was elected the first black mayor of, of Oakland, um, partly because the Panthers registered so many people to vote. And that's something we all need to do. You know, we wonder what to do. I hope all of you if you want to, we'll get out, not in Palo Alto necessarily, or San Francisco, or heavily Democratic districts, but maybe in some swing districts, if you have the time to volunteer and register people um, to vote. Again, registering to vote. Political education, that's actually at, uh, Sada Shakur. And here's some very strong Panther women. Afini Shakur is on the, uh, on the left. Those of you who are familiar with uh, the rapper, which is fun. She was a Panther. And women with the children. And look at the positivity and the passion and the, and the love. That was really another very important message from the, the, the Panthers, which the panel will, will talk about, I'm sure. Um, this wasn't a hate movement. It wasn't an against movement. It wasn't, you know, 
we're depressed, we're ho No, it's we're joyful, we're loving, we love all people, we want a just society for all people, very, very positive. This was the funeral of George Jackson, again, woman. Kathleen Cleaver, Erica Huggins, and Asali is on the right. <laughs> when, when she had a lot of hair. <laughs> <laughs> you still do. I think you all know who's on the left. And that's Bobby Seale and, and his wife selling the Panther newspaper. Again, the Panthers had a newspaper which went nationwide. And I will now turn it over to the panel of the women who can talk much better than me. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, to tell you a little, a little more about myself, I am a, a professor of African and African American studies, but in particular, I have an interest in the, the use and appropriation of photographs from black social movements in t-shirt culture. <coughs> I'm sitting here wearing a t-shirt. This t-shirt <coughs> can be purchased at the Mural House in West Oakland, but I've had a specific interest in in Stephen's photographs from the Power to the People uh, book and the, the Black Panthers book, which those images of Black Panthers and black leather and berets that we've seen in documentaries <coughs> and films and reenacted and their use in t-shirts and hip hop in particular, right? And so it's an honor to one, be able to speak with you all more about how Panther women understand themselves, right? If this panel could have like a subtitle, like a theme, running through this panel, it would be image and voice. <coughs> image and voice, right? Understanding Black Panther women speaking for themselves. Mm -hmm. Black Panther women speaking for mm -hmm. themselves. So as discussed earlier about the Black Panther Party, it's estimated that six out of 10 Panther Party members were women. And this pictorial anthology tells the story of some of these women who were the backbone of the party. There are over 50 contributions from former women members included in this anthology. And the most impactful elements of this book is how these women vividly recall the personal experiences from that time. So because this book is a statement on then and now, I'm curious about the ways women in the party view their representation across the decades. In the 1970s, there was a series of news reels and reports in the 1980s we saw a rise in documentaries and autobiographies featuring the Panthers. In the 1990s, we began a period of theatrical representations and depictions in film and more biographical documentaries about the Black Panther Party. And now, the current moment is ripe with examples of Black Panther Party self-produced documentaries, museum exhibits, naming and muraling projects, and oral history anthologies. So my curiosity is, right, what does all this mean for the women in these photographs and how they understand what has been done to their image as Panthers over time? What sense do they make of the nostalgia, right? The nostalgia, the idea of, of how we look back and who looks back versus the reality of their lives lived as rank and file members of uh, the Panther party, right? So to start off, my first question for you all would be, what does this book mean to you? What does this book mean to you? Well, oh, go ahead. Well, I'll say it means everything. <laughs> um, it, it is such a wonderful celebration uh, of, of an, an acknowledgement and recognition, because there have been many books, as you mentioned, uh, that have been written over the years, movies, et cetera, et cetera, but this is really one, one that profiles and highlights the women, and, and it just means everything. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a joy for me to read through the book and see the wisdom. When you read the book, the wisdom that's in it is just going to be lifted up 
and it speaks to it speaks to women, but it speaks to everybody. But the to uh, you know because not all the women in there that I I knew, and so to read their stories and just to see what that what was lifted up and the wisdom and the beauty that's lifted up. So it it means a lot because historically women are. Uh, voiceless, characterized as voiceless. They're uh, in visual images. Um, they've been characterized uh, very limited, in limited roles. I can, for example, um, like she said, I was a minister. If you go in the Bible and you look at how the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get too far into it, but if you look at how <laughs> Tamar was depicted, she was only depicted as a prostitute, and there was so much more, when you read the story, there's so much more volume to her. So this is a very important book because it gives you a three-dimension uh, visual and written of who we were, and, and we were individuals, but we were there for a common cause. You know. Thank you. That is beautiful. The the book ha had for three decades been a dream of mine. And I remember being with Angela Ernest, who been the most the pillar of this book, supporting Steve and I as co authors and supporting all of the women. I want you to hear that. Angela, could, do you mind standing? Yeah, you do, yeah. I know. <laughs> and she, she said once, and this is part of what my dream was, that when she began as a, an undergraduate student at 18 to look for the women of the party, couldn't find them. Mm. And one day we were in conversations with a group of women. I don't know if either one of you were there when Angela said this. She started to cry and she said, now here you are. Mm. Mm. And those conversations, I always had tissues nearby. <laughs> because this dream of honoring and thanking and valuing and underscoring, highlighting all these women who gave their lives some gave everything. And they didn't expect a thank you. People said to me, you want me in a book? Mm -hmm. And yes, we did. And it didn't matter to the point you made about not knowing everybody. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how we would just come on the screen? We did the initial conversations. They were not interviews. Um, on Zoom. That was part of the process. Mm -hmm. We would see one another. Hey, sis. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. I never yeah. met you, but I know who you are yeah. because we were bonded by this love yeah. that we took into community, that we received. It's a reciprocal thing. Love isn't transactional, not real love. And so when Rosita was saying it means everything, it touched my heart because this, this book is only the beginning. And researchers, scholars like Angela will have a beginning, somewhere to start, a big somewhere to start, I feel, with Stephen's beautiful photographs and these women's lived experience. Thank you, Erica. You're welcome. So, so true, so true. Um, and feel free to clap whenever the spirit moves. T. Right. Um, we 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 are informal here, and something that I really love what you just said was about the love, right? Yeah. The love. Mm -hmm. held between one another, whether you knew each mm -hmm. other's names or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, and within the party, that's something that a lot of times photographs and photographs that find its way 
into the visual lexicon, right, out there mm -hmm. in the popular that is uh, circulated the most, those are not the images that we see, right? Mm -hmm. No. No. Uh, we usually see images because of the media as an apparatus of white supremacy, et cetera. Um, thinking about the ways that women are positioned as support for the male leadership, mm -hmm. right? Um, but in my research, when I talk to Panther veterans, that's never how they explain the relationship ever, women mm -hmm. or men. Um, and something that I'd really like to know is in that service and seeing everyone as working within the collective, right? Um, what did you learn from the party in mm -hmm. terms of service, right? Um, what did you learn from the party that in different ways have served you over the years? Mm. And perhaps change your perspective in your life over the years. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Just ask that question again. Okay. Just, just, uh, tell yeah. me what you learned about service from the yeah. party. And yeah. and if you could give us examples of the different ways that you yeah. served in the party. Yeah. I I would hope that I can make it brief. Um first of all, I am I I was not the first artist. Tarika Madalaba Lewis was the first artist, woman artist. But I was the only woman artist between 72 and 74. I joined in Seattle when we were called down here. They recognized my talent, and I started working for the newspaper. In 74, when the school opened officially, I began to work in the school. And I did, I, I taught art, I mean, I taught preschool using art as a tool, and then I was an art teacher for the general school, and I did things like the logo for the school, you know, so I, I used my art that way. So my art was used in the newspaper to serve as a communication without, and, and art crosses boundaries without having to talk a lot or write a lot. It crosses Literacy, Ill illiteracy, it crosses all kind of boundaries and borders. And we were teaching the children how to think, not what to think. All of that is service. And we were in, uh, in when I was doing for the newspaper, the time that I came in was during the election, the campaign, Oakland, a base of operation, and we were running Bobby Seal and Elaine Brown for office. And we tied everything to the 10-point platform and program, which says that caring was the focus. Caring, we should be in a, uh, what, what did I call it, social safety net. There was no social safety net or very little social safety net for people um, that in our communities. And so we, was, we were basically... This is what we're supposed to have as a social safety net. We're, there should children should eat. There should be medical care for the community, et cetera. Okay, so trying to make it short. It's to okay. It. Okay. You are free to <laughs> explain as much as you like. Well, so anyway, that's service, and we were taught to serve the people, body and soul, and that's what we did. We created programs because we cared for the community. Okay. And um, like, remember Arlene and Safe, you know? Oh, I was just thinking about Arlene. Yeah, yeah, you know. And so, um, how did how did that carry? How that carried beyond uh, the party? Um, once uh, at a certain point, I think that's even why I went into the ministry because I wanted to serve in, in uh, one capacity or the other. And uh, I started the um, art and dinner program for the children in the neighborhood because there was a kid child in the neighborhood. I said, so what did you have for dinner last night? Um, some potato chips. And so we started the art and dinner program. I could only do it one. My goal was to do it for seven days a week, but we could only get it for one day, you know. 
and we allowed the, the uh, uh, Little Bobby Hutton tutoring program to come into the school. I was on the um, Berkeley dispute resolution, and I was an, an advocate for mental health in the city of Berkeley. So I did, it, it, it was just automatic. It, and it wasn't even a, 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 um, a thought like, how do I continue to serve? It was just automatic. Mm -hmm. And since 2010, I've started getting back into my art again. And so I continue to work uh, um, um, to serve through my art. Thank you, Asali. I'm going to answer the, what does service mean in a slight twist, and, and it's with regard to what attracted me to join the party in the first place. And because at the time, the, um, uh, these survival programs were being set up, the breakfast mm -hmm. programs were in its early stages. In Seattle, we hadn't, um, hadn't yet set up the medical clinic. And so rather than because I would go to the rallies and listen to the rallies and, you know, learn, you know, and rah-rah and whatnot. But, but, but what really spoke to me was the opportunity to actually do something uh, and take action and to make a difference in the community and show love for the community in, in those ways. And so the survival programs were the, were the way to do that. So... Um, and, you know, I always think about like a day in the life of a Panther member, right? Which was wake up in the morning, get, you know, go out to one of the breakfast program locations, cook hot breakfast, clean, you know, serve, serve the children the breakfast, send them off to school, clean up, get back, you know, change clothes, go sell papers, right, right. <laughs> come back, you know, uh, and work in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the medical clinic or, you know, if we had a project to to uh, can take sickle cell anemia tests at the high school or wh whatever. So it was like a day in the life. I mean, uh, my whole life and, and that my day was dedicated to, to serve in the community. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was, it wasn't just us doing the, the serving, is that the, the community members would, we call community workers, and they were just like, you know, they, or were there at the breakfast program locations, the mothers, the whoever in the, in the community come, you know, and, and work with us together, um, you know, in order to deliver these, these um, wonderful programs that I'm still so proud of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What, what you just said really made me think about a follow-up question that I had, and you took the words right out of my mouth. What did it look like in, the, in a day and in the life of a rank and file regular, you know, Panther member, right? And I have that question because so often students, 19, 20 year olds, might ask, well, what can I do? I don't have a degree yet, you know? I don't have, you know, any letters behind my name. I don't have any special skill set. Um, I don't know how I could contribute meaningfully to an organization, so I'm just gonna wait four years. And then I'm going to wait until I get my master's. Then I'm going to wait until I own property and I have a house, right? Tell us what it was like as a 16, 17, 18, 19 year old coming into the party. And what were some of the things that you did every day, like everyday tasks? Um, because what I'm hoping in this conversation we can illustrate is this idea that you start from where you are. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful what you just said, Kim. You should be on this panel. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but what everybody is saying is that we talked about this yesterday and the day before at the events we've we are having events all over the place. And there is this notion, and, and Oakland Community School, which followed the Intercommunal Youth Institute, as Steve said, um, as Asali said, we taught the children how, not what, to think. And that what to think part tells us that if we get a degree, we have education. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh, there was silence. <laughs> right? Isn't that what we're taught? However, that isn't necessarily so. And we got education by giving. And then it taught us how to give some more, mm -hmm. or in a different way. Mm -hmm. And we listened. This is the thing that I loved. As Steve, I think it was Steve said earlier, we didn't go tell the people what they need. That has been done throughout history, right? And some of you know this. Go tell women what they need. <laughs> <laughs> and what they ought to do with their bodies. Their bodies. <laughs> we did none of that. We said, what is it that you want? You children, the elders, you children could feed the babies. I can't get to the grocery store or the bank. Could you, could you children take me to the bank? That's how we started a senior's program, the Seniors mm -hmm. Against a Fearful mm -hmm. Environment. Are getting and robbed. Remember yeah, they, they were afraid robbed. of being robbed, but they weren't bitter about it. They just wanted to get to the grocery store and back. And as we did what we were doing and what was in a day, some of it was looking at how we could do it better and talking about it. And so when we were remembering Arlene just a minute ago, she died in her 30s, and we don't know why. But I remember her because she called me one day, Erica, <laughs> I just took Miss Johnson to the bank and to the grocery, and I brought her home. And she said, well, honey, you can't just leave. Come on in and get something to eat. And what Miss Johnson needed was companionship. Arlene found that she lived all alone in her house, none of her family around. Because we don't respect elders. Yeah. I'm not talking about the ones of us on this. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> uh, no, this we, nation, no. no, our country doesn't yeah. respect children and elders, young people and elders. And so Arlene called me to say, I think we need to add something to this Seniors Against a Fearful Environment program, the SAFE program. We need to make sure we visit them regularly. Mm -hmm. And yesterday and the day before, some of the women on a panel at Marcus Books or at the Mural Project were talking about how their day included going to see what the elder named Charles what, had he gotten his medicine okay? Did he eat his dinner? And they went door to door. This is how we were. We weren't sitting and talking about what could be done. We, we were bored with that, really mm -hmm. bored with having a meeting about a meeting to figure out <laughs> right, what Right, right. <laughs> and a committee. And, and, and a committee. That's right. And, and yeah, then a committee. Right. <laughs> because we knew what was wrong. What we needed was to just listen to what people thought would be some kind of good medicine. And so the programs, the 64 community survival programs, developed out of that. The, the free shoe program. Children couldn't go to school in New York City in the winter with no shoes, and so they didn't. And then we came along, they had shoes, winter coats, mm -hmm. clothing. Mm -hmm. There's so much, I mean, if, if please read the book. Mm -hmm. I know it's, you know, in my house, my mother called them coffee table books when they were big and had pictures in them. Don't let it sit on your table. And don't overthink the women's words for the photograph. It's not a research project. It's for your heart. Mm -hmm. We need to bring love back into mm -hmm. the recipe. Come on now. Yeah. And, and, I, and as I was remembering Arlene and her sweetness for Ms. Johnson, 
that changed the whole, that one little phone call changed the whole SAFE program so that we did visit them. And, and the school was like that. Three little boys, I mm -hmm. said, why are you, why are you at the school at four o'clock in the afternoon? Does your mother know where you are, your father? And they looked at me a little sheepishly and said, Mama's working, two of them were brothers. Mama's working three jobs. So she doesn't come home for dinner. And I stood there and I looked at their beautiful brown eyes and I thought to myself, that's how it is in our community. Now, if your mind is going to why the mother wasn't there and why the children child ate potato chips, that's the wrong way to look at it. I don't know about wrong. That's a surface way of looking at it mm -hmm. because it's systemic. No right. child in the United States ever. There is no reason why mm -hmm. people are houseless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we walk by as if it's their fault. Back to what I was saying about the little boys. So I said, so if you went home, dinner wouldn't be there. Yeah, that's why we're playing basketball out here. Come on, let me get you some snacks. And I got, I got them all kinds of things that they could eat until their mother was home. And then I went in the kitchen, in the school kitchen where we served three meals a day, mm -hmm. home cooked, mm -hmm. intentionally and healthy. And I said to Melvin, the head chef in the kitchen, Comrade, the children are hungry. We give them breakfast and lunch. What can we do? And he smiled. He had this very gentle smile. And he said, well, we could do something. I said, well, can we have dinner too? <laughs> and he said, yeah, comrade, we can do that. And the next day, I don't even know how, we had dinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It was like that. There was so much love that we were receiving. The parents used to call us angels mm. because of the school. Mm. They would cry to get their children in the school. It's the truth, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. And it, we were receiving love, so we could only give it back. That's how it works. It's, mm. it's, there's, there's no small bit of love in anybody's heart. It's infinite, mm -hmm. and we tapped into it, but we didn't have language for it. Right, we're not, we're not even really like conscious, like mm -hmm. this is, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to love. No, it wasn't no. like that at all. Uh -uh. It's just it's innate that caring, that humanity, that caring for one another. And, and it, yes, it stayed with me all my life, all my life. So whatever's in front of me is what I do next. Mm -hmm because of the way that the party showed me that if you see something that needs to be done, who are you waiting on? President? <laughs> Promises, um, Promises. But I'm, I'm talking historically, not just <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. But it also, the Black Panther Party taught me how to be in the present moment. So that when I heard about HIV and AIDS and the toll it was taking on black and brown communities at the height of the epidemic, which became a pandemic quickly. Mm -hmm. I worked at Shanti Project in San Francisco, which was one of the leading organizations. And um, as a result, you know, I was able to Love and be loved. It's, it doesn't stop with, it didn't stop when the organization ended, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. It stayed on. It's the leg, it is part of the leg, legacy. Love is part of the legacy of the Black Panther Party. 
you got you serve the people as one of the women in the book says in order to serve the people you got to love the people mm -hmm. no. thank you so much for that i i um think you you have already started to answer uh my next question which was really you know how did the party change your life <laughs> right really that's my my next question because in serving, you do acquire a particular skill set as an organizer, right? Yeah. That can then be translated in your careers, but also in your life of, of service. And I'm wondering, uh, Asali and Rosita, if you could tell us how then did the party change your life? Um, and from a perspective of how you see yourselves now, looking back. When I left the party, I... Um Changed my life in, in the, an immediate way in that, because um, I was, when I was in the party, I had my high school diploma and that was it. And I was fortunate to have um, gone through a, a high school that had like really advanced administrative skills. So I could type like a maniac and take shorthand and, you know, I was job ready coming out of high school, right? Which I, those skills were applied within the party. So when I left, I, um, I, uh, started work on an associate's degree, and uh, it was a guidance counseling was, was the major, right? So, so I ended up uh, um, uh, finishing that first degree and then working in, which, which was the poverty programs at the time, uh, working with uh, disadvantaged youth and adults and, uh, and, and, and helping them, you know, uh, um, secure employment and training, either on-the-job training vocational training at, at a junior college or whatever, and then counseling and coaching to, uh, you know, to help them kind of understand where they wanted to go in life and, and with this opportunity. So I did that for a number of years. Uh, then I ended up um, finishing my bachelor's degree in human resources and leveraged that, you know, the, the previous experience as um, uh, in human resources as a recruiter. So then how I gave back was working you know, in the community with the Urban League um, uh, and, you know, helping folks write their resumes and do interview preparation, et cetera. So it was all just kind of that whole giving and that, and, and that uh, lent itself to, to my talents and where my passions were. Um, in retirement, I took up quilting. <laughs> and, and so that's my creative expression of, you know, of, of my love and storytelling and whatnot. And then I belong to the, some of my, my quilt guild sisters are here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so I belong to the African American Quilt Guild of Oakland. And part of what we do is uh, give back to the community in terms of uh, charity quilts for you know neonatal unit at Highlands Hospital and and um, and one of our other um, uh, uh, partners is is like a, a child advocacy uh, working with um, um, abused children and so they each get to take a quilt and you know as part of the the, the program that Calico delivers. Um, so we do so charity quilts that way, and then we also conduct you know, community workshops, working with, with kid, kids in schools and whatnot, and helping helping them learn how to sew. So those mm -hmm. are all parts of you know how the party has made a difference in my life. Mm -hmm. And that's Rosita's quilt in the back. <laughs> Both of them. Both yes. of them. Two of them. Yeah. Yeah. And one of them is in the book. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, when I, I was reading in the introduction, um, Stephen, where you were talking about how absolutely politically aware and everything you were as, as a teenager, or unaware. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, when I was a teenager, I knew everything. Right, right, yeah, right, yeah. right. And um, I, I, I think about I'm, I'm 60 in, in 1966, so I'm in high school and I'm like oblivious to almost everything, right? You know, and then uh, I get out and it's, I'm, I'm coming to your, your response. And then I get out and um, the, uh, uh, 
there's a cultural revolution that's happening on the West Coast and it's for black people. And it's like the Harlem of the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And so in this cultural art revolution that's happening on the West Coast, uh, there's, like I said, language. It's communicating to people that didn't like to read like me, you know. And so it's communicating uh, community. And it's communicating, uh, as Erica was saying, love for humanity and one another, you know. And so I'm coming into an awareness of, ooh, who I am as a black, not woman, but a black person. And um, I'm like, oh, I, I, I like, I'm okay being black, you know. I, I, I like being, I'm glad, you know. And so uh, there's also a <laughs> That's so adorable. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so there's also this uh, political, uh, like the art was in the air, the uh, desire to be in community was in the air. You walk down the street, and for some reason, there was this uh, desire to say, How you doing, brother? How you doing, sister? And power to the people. I don't know. I have no idea where that came from. But the Black Panther Party was also started in 1966. And that was the phrase that they used, power to the people. And so we, um, I'm starting to get a little bit of awareness and understanding. Anyway, I get married and I go move to Seattle and we serve in the breakfast program. And then we join the Black Panther Party up there. And we start doing political education classes. And then we're called down here, and I'm recruited to the, um, the art, art, the graphics department, and, and to draw on the back pages of the paper. And now, not only am I just drawing, but we're adding words and language that's all related to the 10-point platform and program which is saying that uh, housing is a right, eating is a right, why are we being hoarded into jail, you know? And so what was happening for me was I was becoming more politically understanding of uh, this world that I am living in and that my people are living in. And that people, period, because what the Black Panther Party did, we crossed boundaries, we, we, we said yes for, uh, for black people, but we uh, aligned ourselves with all oppressed people. And so I'm becoming politically aware and understanding, so when I, even when I leave the party and I have two kids to raise by myself, I'm understanding now what they're talking about what we were talking about real clearly about systemic change because now I'm engaged with the system and I'm trying to make it work for me and it's saying no. And I'm saying, but you got to work. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm beginning to understand that struggle. And, and that over the years, as you were talking about the voting and everything, well, we're going to change this way or we're going to, let's reform it this way. You, we have to move, oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to go that way. But what I recognize very clearly is that, is that the system is not caring. And how do we move to a caring system? So that was the big thing that came to me. And I'm going to tell you one little story. When I, we were going, it was the 50th anniversary, and I was researching my, my images on the back page. And I read, I started reading articles in the, in the paper, right? You know, I typeset the articles, so they were in my head, but that's why I, I have the, whatever the understanding is. But I started reading some of the articles that I typeset, and I was like, no wonder I think like that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
I understood how capitalism worked and the taking of the raw materials and making it here and selling it back. By reading an article by the president of Jamaica who had sent the article to the Black Panther paper, or we got, got that article some kind of way and put it in there. It's a very educational process for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I do have one final question, and do take your time <laughs> with, with this one. Um, and I just want to, to uh, frame it and say um, how we understand that, the, that racism evolves over time, and the, the mechanisms of oppression simply change forms. They don't go away, and therefore, exactly. our strategies of resistance also, those modes of resistance also evolve and change forms. But in terms of racism, ain't nothing changed, right? It's still here. Thank you. I, I want to know, what would you say to a, a woman today? What would you say to the youth today? What would you tell us about service in the current moment? in our current political climate, um, within our current organizations in the struggle today, because the struggle continues. What words do you have for us? I would say, you know, we, we talked about this slightly earlier, is like, look, look at where your particular passions and talents, you know, and what gets you energized, and think about, you know, just know yourself in that sense. And then when you look out at where, you know, the, the needs are, if you will. Um, and, you know, just look for, you know, for that spot. Um, because, you know, some things like, you know, social justice protests are, you know, long haul projects. And, and, right. and so, and that can become frustrating and it can become you know, you can you know get disillusioned or whatever and sidetracked and so you know it's not going to happen and you know, do something else. But you know, it maybe look at things in the short term that you can do that actually you know helps another human. You know, mm -hmm. help somebody in your community, whether it's your 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 university community, the community community, or you know the global community. Yeah. Folks in Haiti, you know and. And uh, and Puerto Rico now need you know need need a little bit of help. Mm, so um, it, yeah, and absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Flint. all over the planet, yeah. right? <laughs> so you know, so just look at look for ways that you know, maybe short term and and then the long haul because mm -hmm. things like the ten point platform that you know we're still fighting the same stuff: healthcare, same stuff. food, decent housing. <laughs> so. So, you know, so kind of balance is what I would say. Find mm -hmm. your passion and go for it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to piggyback off of that. That, that, that is, <laughs> okay. You know, because we all have gifts. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the gifts are, are she, see, this is, she's unfair. Because, see, she had the left brain gift and the right brain yeah. gift. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have gifts, you know, whether my gift is to be a bean counter, you know, we'll be the best bean counter. And all you young people, you guys, you have, you guys are the hope. And you have the gifts that all, what you keep in, in the base, in the bottom, is come from here. And you will find a way to uh, serve and eventually it'll be like that um, Harlem Renaissance that made it to the West Coast. It'll hit a critical mass. And you all, all you individual little grains who are not thinking individually but are thinking in terms of the larger community will come together and you'll be a wonderful, beautiful beach. <laughs> 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 Huh? <laughs> Kim, there's so many things I'm thinking about, you know. But 
I'm sorry for the young people in this room and everywhere yeah. that we couldn't collectively hand over a better world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I'm thinking. But here it is. Here we are. And I was thinking also how we used to say, We'll see revolution in our lifetime. Remember that Three one? Years. <laughs> Three years. Three years. <laughs> we, we were so young and so naive. Yeah. Median mm -hmm. age of the Black Panther Party members, 19 years old. That's yeah. the median age. Mm -hmm. But my friend, Tarika, who was one of the very first women to join the Black Panther Party, was 16. And so... It's, it's important to remember that sometimes we have naivete about how long something will take. And in all the languages around the world where there are movements and struggles, you'll notice that people use terms like the protracted struggle. It's not just rhetoric. They're trying to say it will take generations, but carry some kind of baton that you're willing to pass on mm -hmm. is what I've learned. And so if you keep, if you remember the passion that originally inspired you to step forward and step out, if you can remember that every day at least once, you won't become so despairing that you walk off. Um, that's one of the things that happened for me. And where did I learn that? in prison. Where did I see that I could do something even there? Even though um, for quite some while I was in so solitary confinement. But once they released me into the general population, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> but, it, but it wasn't that I did something that Mm. I did something for the women who were incarcerated. It wasn't about the people that held us in that carceral site. My friend Millie Rivera um, and I created something called the Sister Love Collective. All right. In the, in the prison, mm -hmm. without the guards knowing, mm -hmm. because they thought we were just doing hair. <laughs> because we set it up like that. Because uh -huh. the white women wanted crinkly hair. Puerto Rican women wanted smooth hair. The black women wanted every kind of hairstyle they could. <laughs> <laughs> so under the guise of doing hair, we found out who needed to get their babies back, was struggling to get their children back. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine mm -hmm. that you're in the jailhouse and some government agency has your children. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God John Huggins' mother had my baby. That's true. Or that you were kicking heroin, which at that time in the 70s was just rampant. Mm -hmm. um, but the jail didn't give you any medicine, mm. not even a piece of candy to get through it, so women died. Mm -hmm. So we found out about it, and we started giving over our little zuzus and wham-whams and our commissary little pennies to help women out. We got women lawyers. Mm -hmm. We didn't end, we didn't abolish prisons. We were doing something that was right in front of us that we could do with the skills and experiences that we do have mm -hmm. in the skin that we were in. Mm -hmm. And it was just me and Millie, and then it was a lot of, who was not in the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of women made it happen. I give that example because it, I so remember all the women who supported what we were doing. Um, and I think we saved lives. And we certainly helped some hearts to heal. But we didn't know that then. 
All we knew was that, but you can't get you. You don't have your children. So there is so much we can do that's right in front of us mm -hmm. or to the left, the right, or the back of us. And we don't have to wait. And we don't have to sit and watch the news and scream at the TV. We can <laughs> get up and do something. What the something is is different for each person. Thank you. For Thank you. And thank you for that answer. So please give our panelists a round of applause.